In today's video, we'll be performing some upgrades to my home server rack. In particular, we'll be adding some soundproof material and adding a better cooling system. So this is the server rack I have in my office. It's a Z-Pass SJB rack, that's the brand and model number. People always ask where they can get it or what it is. That's the brand and model number, but I don't really know where you can get it nowadays. Back when I got this, you could get it from their eBay store, but they don't really have an eBay store now. They seem to only sell directly and I don't know if they really sell to the public. I bought this back in, I think, 2013, but it's a really good server rack. And historically, I've never really had an issue with noise because all I had in there was a server that was always very quiet and a switch that, while it did have a fan, the fan never ran. However, nowadays, I've upgraded to a 10 gig switch that has a built-in cooling fan. And I've replaced fans in that with quieter ones. And to be honest, the noise is bearable, but I have plans to add a lot more stuff into this rack. So I want to do something about the noise. It turns out that Z-Pass actually do slash did sell a soundproof version of this rack. However, at the time that I bought this, I didn't buy that one. But looking at the pictures, all it seems to be is this exact same rack with acoustic foam on the inside. So, well, that's what we'll do in this video. We'll take this rack, strip it all out, and install some acoustic foam panels inside and see if that helps the noise level. Don't know if it will, but it might. In addition to that, I also want to upgrade the cooling system. I used to use this rack as an AV cabinet and had my AV receiver in here, which got quite hot. So to counteract that, what I did was I put a basic 120mm fan in the top of the rack because the rack has a space for that, and then connected it into a, a DC 12 volt power supply. You can literally see it sitting down there in a, in a trailing socket plugged into the PDU over an IEC cable. And it is a very bodgy setup. It's an old Corsair PC case fan, and that power supply is from an old Netgear router, and I don't quite know how that's connected to the fan, but I suspect there's probably solder and tape or something involved. It's a very, I set this up years ago, so it's not the best system. And since moving the rack into my office, I actually stopped using that fan because it didn't really need it. However, now I've got the 10 gig switch, it's getting to the point that I might want to use the fan again. And if I start adding more equipment, which I will be doing, I'll definitely need to cool the rack. I tried this fan out recently and it now does, it does work, but when I first plugged it in, it was very unhappy because it had been sitting disused for years and it wouldn't even spin. And I was able to sort of poke it with my finger and get it to start spinning. And now I've, it's run for a while, it seems to work fine, but obviously it's, a, it's very much on its last legs and it's a cheap sleeve bearing fan, so it's not very good quality. So I've got a much nicer system we'll be installing to cool the rack. So I've already mentioned that I'll be upgrading the cooling system to handle additional equipment I'll be installing. But even if I wasn't installing additional equipment, once I install the acoustic foam, I suspect I'll need to have active cooling. That's because currently, if I turn the fan off and shut the door, the rack will still dissipate quite a lot of heat through its metal walls, because metal is quite a good thermal conductor, so even though the heat inside will get quite hot, it'll dissipate out the sides. And if we take a look at a thermal image I took, you can see that the sides of the rack do get quite hot. These were taken without, with the rack fan turned off, and all the heat was being dissipated through the sides of the rack. And you can see that the top of the rack gets quite hot, where it'll be radiating out heat, the sides are quite hot, radiating out heat, and you can even see a particularly hot spot on the right-hand side, which is where the air exhaust on the switch is. However, once I line this with acoustic foam, that's also essentially going to be a thermal insulator, and it's going to keep a lot of that heat inside, so I'll definitely have active cooling. So it'll be really interesting to see how the foam affects the thermal performance of the rack, especially seeing how hot the rack gets without the fan running, with the foam, and without the foam, because I suspect with the foam, it's going to get quite hot. So yeah, it should be quite a fun project. So what we'll do now is we'll jump over to the table and take a look at the hardware we'll be installing, and then we'll get the rack out and install it all. So first up, let's take a look at the foam we'll be using. And this is what we've gone for. It was an interesting decision trying to decide what foam to use. The cheapest approach would be go on Amazon and buy some cheap acoustic foam panels, the stuff that everyone has in their sort of streaming and gaming setups, stick it inside the rack and be done with it. However, my concern with that would be from a fire safety perspective. Very cheap foam has the risk of being also very flammable, and the idea of putting that inside a rack with a bunch of permanently running networking equipment with things like power cables that could potentially spark or heat up, potentially if I was to add like a UPS in the future into that rack, UPS is scare me anyway from a fire safety perspective because I had, a, had one years ago where the batteries failed and got very hot and it was bad. Having that in a cabinet full of foam that could be flammable wasn't, didn't seem like the best idea. Now a lot of that foam is technically fire retardant but it's all quite generic off-brand stuff, so I wasn't sure really what I could trust in terms of fire safety ratings. And a fire retardant foam would have been fine, but that basically means it's kind of self-extinguishing. So if there was a fire or something burnt inside the rack, the foam could still burn, but the idea is it would kind of self-extinguish once the flame went away. The other option is things like fiberglass, which is what these panels here are. These are acoustic panels I have in my office, which are fiberglass filled. 
Those would also be quite good from a fire safety perspective and very good from an acoustic perspective, but they're also extremely expensive and not the sort of thing you'd really want to cut up. So then I found this, which is Pyrosorb S foam. And this is what's called a class zero foam. Class zero is a fire rating and basically that means it's as good as it can be. It basically means it cannot burn, it's completely fire resistant. And this stuff's rated for use in things like engine bays, generator rooms, vehicles, that kind of stuff. Stuff where things can get hot, can burn, and where you don't want the foam catching fire. So it was a bit more expensive than general cheap acoustic foam, but I think for two square metres it was about 80 odd pounds, so not deadly. And this is from a proper reputable UK supplier, so I trust it's actually passed all the fire ratings that it claims to have, rather than something on Amazon where it's very generic and off-brand. So if people are looking to buy this, I bought this from a place called efoam.co.uk. Not a sponsor or anything, but they were pretty good. Lots of places sell this. However, a lot of places seem to sell it in much larger sheets. You get it in like a one meter square sheet or a two meter by one meter sheet, which would be fine, but it would just be really big and inconvenient for me to cut up and the delivery would be harder. It would have to come with a specialist courier, all that kind of stuff. So eFoam sold this instead, which is 500 centimeter or 500 mil by 500 mil square tiles that are self-adhesive. Self so this seemed much like a much easier option because it'll be much easier to cut up, fit in, and just much easier to work with. There's lots of different thicknesses as well. And I think at the thicker levels, you can also get ones that have like various wavy patterns and stuff in them. This is the 25 mil thick stuff, which is basically level like the thickness as thick as I could go, where it would still fit in the rack and the side rails in the rack would still fit. So this is 25 mil thick Pyrosorb S foam. And it seems like quite cool stuff. It's, it doesn't flake off at all. It seems pretty good. One of the panels has a little bit of a defect on it. It's got like, this weird sort of cut off corner and then this corner is a little bit hard, which isn't ideal. So that's not the best. It's fine, I'll, I'll just try and cut it to either not put this bit in the rack if I can cut this off as an excess, or at least I'll try and hide it. But a little bit annoying, but that's probably fine. I can deal with that. But yep, we've got basically two square meters of foam. So I've been talking about how fire resistant this foam is, but let's quickly test it and see if it actually is. This is obviously a massive do not try this at home section. So do not try this at home, but I've got a little bit of foam in here. So let's see if it burns. So let's test this. There we go. Nope. It goes kind of... Nope, it literally... Even like a blue flame on that, that'll be really hot. It slightly glows around the edge. That's it. There's no burning and then like self-extinguishing. It's literally just... Well, not burning at all. That's really quite impressive. So then here's the foam after the fact. I've just let it cool a little bit. Let's see what it's like. It's actually still has really a lot of its structure. Like it's, it, yeah, the top's flaking off. It's kind of a bit ashy, but yeah, that is not burnt away. If you compare that to like a, a flame test of like even fire retardant acoustic foam, the foam will basically ignite burn away to nothing, but then once the flame goes away, it self-extinguishes. This, like, yeah, it's barely even affected it. It's actually, that's really impressive. Obviously the top's flaking off, but yeah, there is definitely no chance of that catching fire. So yeah, definitely seems to be very fire resistant, which is good. So that's enough rambling about some foam. It's not very exciting. Three minutes plus rambling on foam. So what I'll now do is take a look at the cooling, which is going to be a little bit more interesting. So now here we have the new cooling system. I wanted a bit of an upgrade over my current 120mm fan permanently wired into a 12 volt supply. I wanted something a little bit more higher quality and a bit more controllable. And in particular, I didn't just want a thermostat. There's a lot of options out there, including one new rack mount fan controllers that are just thermostats, where they'll turn the fan on and off in, in response to the temperature changing. I didn't want that. I wanted something that would actually adjust the speed of the fans in response to the temperature changing. Because a fan turning on and off can almost be more distracting than a, than a permanently running fan. So I wanted something that could actually man automatically adjust the speed of the fan based on the temperature. And looking for that, there was not many options for something that would fit in a rack mount form factor. So I got this. And this is from a brand called AC Infinity. They seem to do a lot of different cooling equipment for things like AV systems. They do some stuff for racks. They also do some nice panel mount AV, panel mount fans that you can install on the side of a wooden cabinet. So you cut a hole in your wooden cabinet out, mount a fan in it, and it's got a nice surround and fan grill. They do quite a lot of stuff for that. But what I've gone for here should be really good for cooling the rack. Now this stuff was actually really hard to com come by. They seem to sell some stuff in the UK, but not all the parts I needed here. So I actually had to buy this from Amazon US and get it shipped internationally. So it wasn't, didn't end up being the cheapest, but it wasn't too bad. 
and it all arrived on time, so it wasn't too bad really. So here's what we've gone for. So first up we have the fan controller, which I particularly like here where it says, do not ship as is, use additional shipping box, shipping label. Thanks Amazon. So thankfully it arrived in one piece because that's not ideal. Um, box is a little bit battered, but it's fine. So here we have the fan controller. And this is the AC Infinity Controller 12. At least I think that's what the model number is, that's what it says on the back. And this is a 1U rack mount fan controller. And this can do thermostatic control, but can also adjust the fan speed automatically based on the temperature reading. So it's not just a thermostat. There's things I could get in the UK that would look similar to this, but they were only thermostats. So it looks quite a nice thing. It's got a sort of brushed aluminium front. Got a little screen on the front here to control it. You can set the temperature on here, read the temperature, all that kind of stuff. Then around the back, there's a DC barrel jack for the power input, a probe connection for a thermocouple we'll take a look at, and then a pair of DC barrel jacks labelled external and a pair of USB ports. And these are to connect to the fans. So don't go using this to say connect like some sort of smart home device or Raspberry Pi or whatever, or phone charger to these USB ports because you're going to end up speed controlling your phone. These are all just for fans because AC Infinity do two different kinds of fans. They do barrel jack fans that can be installed in, say, panels, or they do, a, do ones that mount on the roof of a rack, but it's two fans to mount on the roof of a rack, which wasn't really what I wanted. And those generally would connect into these EXT connectors. They also do their cloud plate fans, which again are sort of 1U rack mount, or 1 and 2U rack mount fans. And again, those can connect into this and be controlled over this DC barrel jack. The other fans they do are like these, which are the multi-fan series, which are USB powered. And the idea is that they're very convenient if you've, say, got a set-top box or a, game, or a games console or something that runs too hot, you can take the fan, put it on top, plug it into the device's USB port and power the fan. So that's why they use a USB connector. But this can also speed control those fans. And ultimately, looking at all the fans they had, the USB fans were just the better option for what I was trying to do. They were the best form factor for where I'm trying to install them. So that's what we'll be using. We'll be getting these two fans up to the USB ports on here, and this will speed control them. So it looks like quite a nice device. So that's the controller there. Let's see what else we get in the box. So we get a couple of little bits. We get a couple of, oh, so we get that, which is a temperature probe. So we'll pull that out. And this is just some sort of thermocouple type temperature probe. It's all very nice polished stuff. Like I know I could have built this myself probably. I could have probably got some sort of PWM fan controller, bodged it into one new frame and then got some fans and put some connectors on it. But this is just nice bang. It was an all-in-one solution that just, it's all completely plug and play. So you've got the temperature probe there, so it's a nice little temperature probe for the barrel jacks, that'll plug in the fan controller. There's then what look like just a couple of just extension cables, I think. These are just, yeah, DC barrel jack to DC barrel jack cables. These will be if you've got an existing fan controller that you want to connect into barrel jacks here, you would use these cables, so I'm not going to need them. And then finally, you get a power supply. And this is the only issue I really had with this, is obviously it shipped from the US, so it came with a US power supply. So that's a little bit annoying, but all I've done is just bought another one. I could have used this with some sort of power adapter, but ultimately this is going in a rack with an IEC PDU. So realistically, I need something that connects an IEC C13 connector, not a US or UK plug. So what I've done is I've gone out and just bought a different power supply. So I've picked this one up here from CPC. It's just a 12 volt, four, 12 volt, 40 watt power supply. Perfectly fine. I think this is 12 volts, 30 watts. So this will be more than sufficient. Same barrel jack on the end. And this one has an IEC connector, so I can easily use an IEC to IEC cable to connect this to my PDU. It's a little bit annoying that they give you this style of wall wart because even if you're in the US, surely this is less practical in many ways than one of these. Because with these, you can't connect it to any sort of PDU. And if you're connecting it to some sort of power strip, you can end up with an issue where this blocks other ports and stuff. So generally, I find these are just going to be much better in every way. You can use them in different countries, you can fit the plugs easier into different cabinets. So it would be nice if it came with this style in the box rather than this style, but oh well, I just won't use this one and we'll just use this aftermarket power supply instead. And that's model, model number there if anyone needed to get one the same. So yep, that's what we get in the box. Other things that I've just noticed, we also get some cage nuts, some screws, some a, a zip tie and one of those sort of self-adhesive zip tie mount things, which will presumably be so if you want you can like stick that in and stick the cable, the temperature probe in using that. It's nice to get cage nuts with it, although I'm going to do my usual rule of not using these because chances are these will be American Imperial Thread cage nuts. Yep, they are. They're number 1032. I don't know American screw sizes. I make a point that if I ever get an Imperial size cage nut, I will not use it in the UK because generally they're metric here. 
And what ends up happening is the Imperial Cage Nuts and Screws get mixed in with metric ones and you can have an absolute nightmare trying to find the ones that fit. So uh, it's nice to get them, but I won't be using those. But yeah, that's the fan controller. So now let's take a look at the fan. So I bought two. My rack has a space for a fan in the top and one in the bottom. So I thought I'll try out two fans, see if they work, see how they work. If I find that I don't really need two, I can always take one out and use one elsewhere. But I've gone for two of these. And these are their Multifan S3 fans. So if you open this up, you'll see it just, you get a little manual, another cable tie and sticker thing. And then all it is, is just a 120mm fan with a USB connector. If you take a look online, you'll see they do these with single fans. They also do sort of dual fan versions. They even do one that's actually advertised for the top of our server rack that has two fans included. However, most of the dual fan ones, you have two fans with a fairly short cable between the fans. Whereas I want to install one in the top of the rack, one in the bottom of the rack. So there'll be quite a long cable length in between. So it made more sense just to get two completely separate fans. So I definitely have the cable length. So it's quite nice there. It's just a 120mm fan. It's apparently a dual ball bearing fan, which is what I wanted. I didn't want a cheap sleeve bearing fan. So it looks quite, quite, quite good quality. It's all AC Infinity brandy. So I have no idea who the OEM of this fan is, but it seems pretty good quality. And then on this end here, you have a USB-A power inlet, inlet a USB-A outlet, sort of daisy chain power to another device or another fan. And it also comes with a little inline fan controller. So for this, I'm probably end up, just going to end up leaving that set to high and then let the fan controller regulate the speed. I suppose you maybe could turn this down to kind of set it to a lower speed than the fan controller is setting it to or to have fat different fans at different speeds. But in the manual for the fan controller, they do say to set this to the maximum speed. So you've got this here. This is nice though, so if you did want to use this without the fan controller and say use it to cool an AV cabinet or just a set-top box or a games console, you can just put that on top, set the speed you want, plug it into the device for power, and it's just an all-in-one USB fan solution. It's quite a nice idea. So yep, that's fan there, the other one's identical. In terms of mounting this in the rack, obviously it just has anti-vibration mounts, so you can just lay it on something and it'll be quiet to sit on that and it's got some fan grills. But these are just screwed in, so literally all I'll do is I'll unscrew one of these grills, mount it in the rack using anti-vibration fan mounts, do the same in the bottom, and that should work fine. So yeah, that's the fans there. So we've got one there, got another one in the box there. We've got the fan controller, and we've got the aftermarket power supply we'll be using. So yeah, all I need to do now is get all my rack disconnected, get it moved out into the hallway because there's no way I can work on that in here. It's far too big, and then start installing new equipment. Okay, so then move the rack out to the hallway just to give myself a bit more space to work on it. So we'll take a look at it. So here's the rack. Obviously, all the kits now completely removed. If you open it up, you've got a door in the front. Open it up there and you see the inside. This really needs a massive clean. It's absolutely full of dust. So before I do anything, I'm going to go off camera and just clean this out. As you can see in there, it's, I can't remember how tall it is. I think it's 20U, 21U, something like that. And it's 600 mil deep. So it, and it can maybe, well, 600 mil deep externally, probably about 550 mil, 500 mil deep internally in terms of what you can actually fit as a server in there. So it's not full depth. You couldn't go and fit like a full depth Dell Power Edge or something in there but it needs to sit in my office where it's on show. I need something vaguely aesthetically pleasing and small. So this is ideal for that. So as you can see, you've got the bars at the front and back that you can mount the rack mount kit on. We've got some rails from a server, which I mounted into both parts and then most other stuff mounts in at the front. So ultimately what we're gonna end up doing is putting acoustic foam all around the inside, including up on the sides behind those bars there. That's why I went for 25 mil foam because it'll fit in this gap here between the vertical bar and the side panel. And it shall be quite good to go. In terms of cooling, as you can see in the bottom, we have a 120mm fan cut out, and there's another one in the top that's already got the fan in. You can see that cable coming down from the old fan. So all I'll do is I'll put the new AC Infinity fans in the bottom and top and cut the foam to fit around them. Then at the top of the rack, you can see the top is spaced off of the main rack with a bunch of nuts under there. Z-Pass did sell what they called a roof elevation kit, which is basically a machine screw and a washer, or a big sort of stainless steel spacer washer type thing that you'd put in there to lift this up. I didn't have that, so instead I just bodged it, got myself a longer screw, got some nuts and used them to lift the, lift the lid up to have space for the fan. I did this well after I'd bought the rack already. I'll take a look and see if I've got any better spacers. I might have some sort of nylon spacers from a TV bracket I could put in. If not, I'll just put it back like this. It works fine. It just looks a bit silly. And long term, I could get a proper spacer. I just forgot to buy any. So that's how I'm spacing the top off. And that gives a decent space here to allow sort of airflow to come out from the top fan. And yeah, I definitely need to take this off as well and clean it because obviously it's full of dust under there as well. So let's get that and clean it as well. Then looking down the bottom of the rack, we have the feet. These are just sort of standard plastic feet just to stand on the floor. They did, did also do wheels for these, so you could have it on wheels. I've not got that, so it's just standard feet. And they are adjustable, so there's a screw thread there, so you can adjust that screw thread up and down 
to adjust the feet to adjust the height off the floor. Currently, I've got it set very low down. I think before I put this back together, I'm actually going to increase these to make these feet higher up because that'll give enough space for the bottom air intake to actually properly take air in. Currently, it's a bit too close to the floor. I think it would work, but I may as well just give it a bit more space. I don't need the height of, for anything else, so I may as well just lift this up a little bit higher just to get a bit more space into the bottom air vent. Finally, taking a quick look around the rear of the rack. It's not really that exciting. The back panel is removable. There's some screws in, there's a screw in each corner you can use to take the back panel off. I rarely do that though because it's stuck in a corner so it's quite hard to get around the back and these screws are a complete pain to take in and out but they are there if you did need to. There's then these knockouts for the cables, so these ones at the top are still fit populated but there's a knockout at the bottom of the brush plate in, I use that to take the power network cables in and there's another knockout just under the top wood panel in the top of the rack, I use that to bring a couple of cables out, I bring the cables out to my desk and then there's a printer on top so a network cable comes out there. So that's two of the rack. What I need to do is take it all apart, clean it even more, and then start getting the foam and the cooling system in. So what I'll do is I'll go off camera, start taking it all apart and clean it all, and I'll just jump back in with little progress updates showing what I'm doing. Okay, so little progress update. I've massively cleaned the entire rack, and I've also extended the bottom feet, so these basically screw in and there's a nut on the bottom. And I actually, in the rack, found a bag containing four nuts that fit on that, so I think that must have come with it, to just extend that out. So all I've done is just loosened up, taking that out, put an extra nut in there just to space them out and that gives probably an extra 10 mil clearance off the floor so that'll be good for the air cooling. So yep, giving it a massive clean. What I've also done is I've also got the fans ready to mount so I've put these Noxia anti-vibration mounts in so I've got this on this fan and the same on the other fan. So based on each fan all I've done is I've removed the grill from one of the sides making sure I've removed the right side for each direction of airflow and then just replaced it with those Noxia mounts so I can just basically push these through the side of the case, pull them in and that'll hold them in as an anti-vibration mount which will be good. So I've done that to the other fan as well. And then the other thing I've done is for the top panel, the tabletop. Previously I had that weird setup where I had a bunch of nuts on a screw trying to space it out. It worked and it didn't look too bad, but it was it just it was a complete nightmare to unscrew and put back in again because every time you unscrew it, the nuts all bunch up together and then get tight and then you can't turn it and you can't release it. It was really annoying. Additionally, they were flathead screws. I hate flathead screws, so I've replaced them. So I found a bunch of M6 screws, in, or I think they're M5, can't remember, M5 or M6 screws. I've got a replacement screw here, and it's just a little bit longer than the old one with a proper slotted posy, I think, head that is, or maybe slotted Phillips, but much better head. And then space it out, rather than do my weird all old sort of bodge with all the nuts, instead of what I've done is I've got some bits of copper pipe, cut them to the appropriate length, and I'll just use these as like spacers, and that'll work fine. It won't probably look ideal, and I'll probably get some proper spacers at some point, I could swear I had some nylon spacers, hence why the cupboard over there is completely tipped out all over the room because I'm trying to like look for them. Turns out I did have them and I literally used them literally about a week ago to put that um, bracket in my AV cabinet to mount the switch that I did in my previous video. So I used up my last spacer for that, completely forgetting I was about to do this project, even though this was already penciled in at that point. So that's annoying, but the copper pipe trick should hopefully work for now. I can always replace it in the future. So yeah, with all that cleaned out, all I need to do is get the, well, there's a lot more to do. I need to get the fans in, get the top back on the rack, and we start putting the foam in. Okay, so we've now got the rack the right way up again, and as you can see, I put the fan in the bottom and the top, so the cables are just tied up for now. I'll fit all the foam around the fans, and then we'll connect the fans up. I wanted to get the fans in first, just so I knew the exact sizes, so I could get them in with the foam, because I didn't know if the foam was there, it might fail getting the fans in. I've also put the top back on with those new copper pipe spacers, and actually, they don't look that silly because it, it kind of blends in with the kind of red wood on the top it actually doesn't look too bad might replace them in the future we'll see but it doesn't look too bad and yet with those new nuts added onto the feet to lift it up a bit higher there's now a lot more space under that for airflow so that'll be really good and then just to prevent people getting rationally upset yes there's an air intake on the floor and yes the floor has carpet on it people seem to get properly irate about this i remember years ago i had a desktop pc sitting on the floor and made a video of it and people got properly upset that my pc was sitting on carpet I have carpet on the floors, I prefer carpet to hard floors. And I'm not convinced really that it's going to get more dust into the cabinet because a hard floor, yes, dust is potentially, doesn't get bedded down into it, but if dust being sucked across the floor into something like that, it will glide much easier across a hard floor than it will on carpet. And I have a vacuum cleaner. I clean my carpets, so there isn't going to be that much dust on the carpet to get sucked in. But anyway, just preempting the comments. But yep, all I need to do is get the foam cut and put in. So. I'll go way off camera and start doing that. If I tried to film that, it would just be a nightmare because I'd be cameras and lights and cutting foam, it's just gonna go wrong. So I'll do all that off camera and we'll come back and we'll sort of jump in as, I, as I'm getting on with it and talk about how it's going. 
So very quickly for a laugh, let's take a look at the old cooling system, if you could call it that. I think this dates back to 2014 or something like that. Just thinking back to when I would have first put an AV receiver in this cabinet, it's very old. So don't judge it too hard. So first of all, we've got a IEC to UK plug trailing socket. This is newer. Um, when I initially built this, I didn't have a PDU in the rack. So this was later put into, I, th I think I actually did make this up initially to power this in the old rack when I first got the PDU. Since then, I've obviously repurposed this for other things, but I did put it back in when I wanted to bring the fan back in service. That's of course a fairly standard, normal, sensible thing to have. But then you've got the power brick, which is an old Netgear power adapter. This is off an old wireless G DSL router from Netgear, one of those white ones that everyone used to have back in the day. It's one of those. I think the router had died, so I had the power brick spare. It's literally covered in paint from wherever the router was installed once back in the day. So I'd cut the barrel jack off that. And then that is then somehow attached onto this, which is an old, this old Molex connector that I'd clearly just cut off a power supply because it's literally got the bare wire sticking out the end of it there. And if I remember correctly, I used to have a different fan that was a Molex fan, so this plugged straight into the fan. Then at some point that fan either failed or I wanted to upgrade it, so I had this Corsair fan which was a standard 3-pin fan, so I then had this old Molex to 3-pin adapter that I then obviously bodged onto this to then connect this better fan in, and yeah, that was the setup I had, and that has definitely literally just been cut off a power supply. It's not the most professional setup. Let's, let's see here how I joined these wires. I really hope I didn't, I at least soldered them or something, I didn't like just, yeah, I've soldered them, of course I have. I wouldn't be doing this nowadays, obviously, and I'd, if I was soldering wires, I would be using heat shrink, not electrical tape, but yep, that is how I'd attach the wires back in the day. Not my finest work, but hey, it worked for many years, so yeah, that's the old cooling system. I think this new setup, although it was quite expensive, it's going to be a bit more polished than this. Okay, we're getting somewhere, so I've now put the foam on the back panel of the rack. It's pretty easy to use, I mean, it, it isn't the easiest thing to cut, but it does cut okay, it does make a bit of a mess all over the floor, but I'll just need to clean that up. But it's pretty easy to stick in, the adhesive is super strong, so that's good, it's definitely not going to come, up, come off at all. And I've just cut out a little patch there for the brush plate for the cables coming in, and a bit around that air plug as well. So it should be easy enough to do, I'll just need to continue on and just keep sticking the rest of it in, but yep, that's on there, so I'll get this back panel on and then just get the rest of the foam in, but yeah, it's going pretty well. And there we go, that's all the foam put in. It's now many hours later, I completely underestimated how long this would take, but it's now done. And I'm really going to have to clean in here because there is foam absolutely everywhere. But yeah, it was pretty easy to put in. Cutting it was okay, I initially used scissors to cut all the edges to size, I didn't need to cut that many pieces. But then when it came to cutting out the, cutting out the cutouts for the fans, I ended up actually using a bread knife and sawing through it and that actually worked really well. So yeah, that's all the foam in. It's pretty good stuff, the adhesive was pretty strong. There was a few quality issues where I found on quite a few bits of the foam along one edge was quite, was a bit harder, a bit crustier than all the other edges, which is a bit annoying, but it was fine, I was able to deal with that. And then some of the backing paper was a bit rippled and that backing paper is impossible to draw in with Sharpie, so that was a really annoying thing to try and mark out. But apart from all these little niggles, I got it all in. And also I've not tested the acoustics yet, I have got a bunch of before measurements from the previous setup, but even just having my head in the rack while sticking the foam in and talking, it is significantly more dead sounding inside there than it used to be. So that's hopefully bodes well to the sound performance of this. But yeah, that's all in. So what we'll quickly do is we'll jump in closer and just take a look at it all up close, and then we'll get the fans put in. So we can see the foam in the bottom and sides. So a 500mm by 500mm panel almost filled it, so I just basically put that in the corner and then just filled in little filler pieces around. I was able to actually do this and leave a complete panel as an offcut, which is quite good to have a complete spare. I initially measured this as being almost requiring exactly two square metres, so either my calculations were off or just the amount of tiny little bits that aren't covered, say in here, or where the thickness of the panel covers up part here anyway, so I don't need a piece this way, that somehow is freed up an entire sheet, so that's quite good. I mean, I needed to buy it in a, pa in a packs of four sheets anyway, so it's not like I paid any extra. But yeah, that's all now in. So we see the foam on the bottom, foam on the sides. Each side has again one full panel, one half panel, and another little filler panel at the back. And it's all going quite well. You also see there's a big hole at the back where the brush panel used to be. Ultimately, I want to plug up both the hole on the back here and the hole on the top. But the hole on the top is one I'm probably going to be using more regularly, so I've put the brush panel up there, left that one empty because all that will have is a network cable and a power cable. I never really accessed that. And I just took two offcuts of foam and literally stuck them together. 
So that can kind of plug in that hole. I can just squeeze that, stick it in the hole, and it'll plug it. So that'll plug up that hole in the bottom there. And then here we can see the fan. So this little cutout here is for some like earthing lugs that the rack had. I don't use them, I don't need them, but I just sort of thought I'd cut it around anyway. And then the fan's now in there. So it's on those Noxia fan mounts, but then it's kind of sitting cut out in the foam. And I had a bunch of offcuts of foam, so I just kind of shoved it around the edge just to make the gap a little bit smaller. It's probably not a huge difference, but I thought I would just try, try and kind of completely smooth it and hide it out of the way. And it looks really neat, especially from a distance without a big bright light on it where you can see that off cut. It looks completely clean, which is really good. Also down here where the rack bars come through, I put all the foam in initially and then all I did to put this in was just cut a little slot and shove it in. So it looks again really, really neat. You can't even sort of see where it comes out. It's not like I've had to cut out a big bit around this. It just pops up through the foam. And it's actually even better looking on the other side because on this side here, there's a, just two bits of there's a little filler piece of foam here because this wasn't wide enough. But here it literally just comes out the foam with no additional cuts, so it looks really, really good. And then as you may have seen before, these bars can slide back and forward and it's just a cage nut and a sort of sliding slot here and a screw in from the front. But it's actually easy enough to kind of push the foam down along the edge and actually access that slot. So it's easy enough to do that. So even if I do need to move these bars in the future, I can do it. I would need to obviously cut an additional slot this way just to get the bar through the foam but I can easily do that. It's not like it's completely stuck in position and it can never be moved, so that's good. And then looking on top of the rack, we have the fan there. So again, top is completely covered. So yeah, really happy with how all this looks. So what I need to do is get the fan controller put in. So I've already shown the all the fan controller hardware before, but we have the fan controller here, so that's gonna kind of mount basically up the top of the rack there. I'll then have the cables and the fans go sort of neatly, route them up the back or something into this. I'll need to figure out where I'm going to mount the, fan, the power supply. I'll, I think I'll always, I've got a rack shelf in here and I think I'll always have a rack shelf in here of some description. So I'll probably just sort of stick it on that maybe. And then, obviously I've got the temperature probes, so I'll need to figure out how to mount that. So I'll go away off the, away off the camera, do all that, and I'll take a look at the fan's working. And then we'll finally put all the rack back together. And there we go, that's all the fans now in and powered on, and it works. So I've mounted the fan controller up here. The power brick's currently just sitting on the bottom, plugged in through the back. I'll sort all that, I'll put it on a shelf or something when I get all the kit in. But yeah, they all work. Noise level seems pretty good. On the lower fan speeds, it's kind of equivalent to my old fan, as in you basically don't hear it. It's a relatively quiet hum. At the higher speeds, it does become quite audible, but I don't think I'll actually need any of those speeds given that the amount of airflow my old fans moved was significantly less than one of these fans at the lowest speed. So I should be absolutely fine. And it's just nice having an additional headroom there. So on say a very hot day when the servers are working really hard for some reason, if the rack started to get a little bit too hot, the fans can ramp up really easily to a very high speed and really quickly clear that heat out of the rack. So that's quite good. So what I'll do very quickly is I'm just gonna go in a bit closer and take a quick look at the interface on this and show how it works. Just because I know most people won't care about it, but if you're buying one of these, this could be quite useful. And then we'll do what everyone's probably wanting to see and get all the equipment installed back in the rack and see how well it all performs. Okay, so here we have the interface. So let's talk about it. So when I first took it out of the box, it was obviously in Fahrenheit because it came from the US. And I had a slight panic thinking, does this actually support being switched to Celsius? But it does. So to do that, you hold down this little equal green leaf button and that'll switch it between Celsius and Fahrenheit. And then do the exact same again, switch it back to Celsius. I think it resets the parameters at that point, or at least it saves the Fahrenheit ones and then gives you just slightly different parameters between them. But yeah, that converts it between Fahrenheit and Celsius. So you can do that. This leaf button also just switches the screen off and back on again, so it's like an eco mode. You can turn the screen off and turn the screen back on. The screen also dims, so it's, it comes on brighter when you start interacting with it. It dims to a lower brightness when, you're, when you've left it a while and you can turn the screen off with that if you wanted to. But I think I'll leave the screen on, it's quite nice. Next up, you've got this mode selection button here. And this cycles through various different modes that are indicated by these let symbols and letters at the bottom of the screen. So the first mode is AT, which is auto mode. This is a thermostat, so as you can see, Probe is sensing temperature 23, setting the set to 27, fans aren't running, speed zero. If we start decreasing the set temperature, you'll see that eventually when we hit 23, the fans come on to full speed and they'll continue to set at full speed no matter what the set temperature is. And as soon as we go above 23 on the setting, the fan speed drops down to zero again. So that's just a thermostat, the fans will turn on and off on the thermostat. That's not what I want. Instead what I want is smart mode, so this is smart mode. And this is where it adjusts the fan speed based on the temperature. So as you can see, the probe is sensing a temperature of 23. The, temp the thermostat is set to 24, so the fans are running at speed 5. 
I'm going to change the set temperature to 25, so it's a lot, the set temperature is 2 degrees higher than the probe temperature. The speed drops down to 4, then down to 3, down to 2, down to 1. And then eventually, once the probe temperature is a full 6 degrees less than the set temperature, the fan completely turns off. So this is kind of what I want. You come down, and of course at any point it's the, set temp the probe temperature is set above the set temperature, the fans will run at full speed. So that's pretty good, and that's exactly what I wanted it to do. The only thing to bear in mind with this is that the, if the temperature in the cabinet is, even if the temperature in the cabinet is slightly below the set temperature, the fans will still run and they can run at quite high speeds. So you could say, for example, have a situation where you want the cabinets to stay at 26 degrees, the cabinet's actually 23 degrees, but the fans are running at speed 3, where you might actually not want the fans running that fast. You might just need to play about and kind of adjust your set temperature to fit really the fan speed that you're kind of expecting it to sit around. But there's more parameters, so next you press the button, you'll get this option for S. And this is just a constant speed, so you can just adjust this here up and down and just set the speed of the fans. What this also serves as is, a, is the speed that you're setting for the auto mode, the thermostat mode, and the speed limit for the smart mode. So if I were to say set this down to say speed 3, and I then cycle back to the thermostat mode, as soon as I trigger the thermostat to come on, it will now only go to level 3, not 6. Likewise for smart mode, if you go over to that, you can now see no matter how low I set the temperature, it will not go above speed 3. And of course, as you start going above, it drops into 2, 1, and then off. So that's how that works. So if you use a speed mode, you can either set it just a fixed speed, or it sets a speed limit for thermostat, for, for smart mode, or sets the actual speed the thermostat mode will operate at. So I can leave that on 6, but you can kind of change that. And it's nice to have that ability to limit the speed. The next mode we have here is the alarm, so that's A for alarm, and you can set a temperature over here, that if the probe sends the temperature above that, an alarm will sound, so you set to say 8 degrees, which is way lower than the 23 degree room temperature, and I go back to there, after a few seconds, an alarm goes off. So that's the alarm going off there. It's quite good, it's the sort of thing you would hear if you're near the rack, but you're not, it's not going to annoy you if you're in another room. But it's, that's quite a nice feature to have. And then pressing the sort of mode selection button will then clear that alarm by just sort of turning it off, basically. So that's really good. The final mode you'll see here is buffer. So if you go along to buffer, which is B, that's this temperature here. And you can set this between 1 and 4 degrees. What this is, is a sort of, well, it's a buffer around how quickly the fan speeds will change. So when you're using it on auto thermostat mode, this is how much the temperature needs to change for the fans to turn on or off. So with this, if the temperature fluctuates by one degree, that can turn the fan on and off. If you set that to four, the temperature would have to increase by four degrees before the fans turn on, and then decrease by four degrees for the fans to turn off. Under smart mode, this defines how quickly the speed changes. So with it set to one degree, you can see every time I move the set temperature up by one, the fan speed drops by one. On the other hand, if I set the buffer to say 2 and go back to smart mode, every time I increase the set temperature by 2 degrees, the fan speed changes by 1. So that's what the buffer is there. I'm probably just going to leave that on 1, but where that is really useful is if you're in a situation and you find that the fan speed is just fluctuating too often. If you've got it on thermostat mode, the fan's turning on and off too often, or if you've got it on smart mode, you're just noticing the temperature change it, the fan speed changing too often that can get quite annoying because a constant fan noise is generally quite easy for your brain to drown out, but a fluctuating fan noise can be quite noticeable. You can particularly notice that point that the fan changes in speed. So if you found that that was happening too often, it was getting distracting, you can increase that buffer just so it doesn't change, that, change as often. So yeah, that's the interface there. It's pretty easy to use. It took me a little bit of time to get my head around it, but once I figured it all out, it was absolutely fine. So yeah, I really like it. So I think the final thing to do before I put this back is I've just noticed there's still plastic on the screen, so let's peel that off. Oh, and fail at doing that. And get the rest of the equipment installed in the rack. And we're back. And honestly, I'm amazed at how well this has worked. I think earlier I said something about, oh, well, we'll see if it works, it might not make a difference. And I even had to kind of start, start started planning in my head about what I would say if it didn't make a big difference. But the difference in terms of sound from this rack is huge. I've done some proper measurements to actually try and establish how much we've actually decreased the sound, so we'll go through some, some of those in a minute. But even just based on personal experience, 
with the door closed on this rack, it is so much quieter. That switch has a slight high-pitched whine noise you can kind of hear. I think it basically uses quite a low frequency for the fan PWM, and you can kind of hear that frequency. That's gone. You can just not hear it with the door shut. It works so well. In my testing, I also put a little one U server in there that you can that when the fans are ramped up quite loud is really really loud. That'll be coming in a future video, so I'll keep that server secret for now. But with that server in there, with the old rack, it was really loud. But now with this one, you can ramp the fans up quite high on that, and it's audible, but it's not nearly as loud. It'd be interesting to know how this actually works from an acoustic perspective. The foam is definitely blocking some level of sound coming out the rack, but I think what it's also doing is just blocking re reverberation inside the rack. Annoyingly, I didn't record this bef before I put the foam in, but when you used to knock on the side of the rack, it sounded quite hollow, it was quite a loud bang sound, and it, the sound sustained for quite a while afterwards. It was almost like a drum, it was quite a hollow sound when you knocked on it. But now when you knock on it with the foam, it's like a solid dead sound. It's made such a difference even to that, and I think that's stopping the sound reverberating inside a lot, and that's definitely really helping. And the foam is also just going to stop a lot of the sound coming through the sides. But yeah, the difference is absolutely huge. The cooling system is also working really well too. So I've changed some of the settings on it. So I've set it to a 3 degrees buffer just so it's not changing the speed as often. And it's sitting there around about 30 degrees. Well, 30 degrees on that screen. The temperature readings you'll see in a minute are a bit higher than that because I've measured them with a separate thermocouple that I use in the old rack as well. And there's a couple of de degrees difference between my thermocouple and the screen on that. But I've got no idea what's more accurate, the thermocouple is a cheap little thing. So, yep, it's in there perfectly fine there. It fluctuates maybe a degree or two every so often, so that's why I've set the buffer to three, and it's working really well. Noise-wise from the fans is also really good. I think even on speed one, they're slightly louder than my old fan. However, a case, a fan cooling the rack isn't really a problem from a noise perspective, because it's quite a low frequency sound, it's quite a broadband sound, so it's quite an easy to drown out noise. It's just a sort of low hum. The problematic noise with server racks are things like servers that have little 40mm fans that have a really high-pitched whine to them, and the rack really helps block those out, so the little hum from the rack cooling system is not a problem at all. And as you can see, I've put the, put the rack shelf in there and just put the power supply on it. I'm actually in the process of editing the video, and during that came up with a much better idea, so you'll have probably already seen this explained in a sort of title card I've put in the video. But what I might actually do in the future to mount the power supply is instead of putting it on this rack shelf here, I'll get another one new rack shelf and mount it behind the fan controller. So essentially take the fan controller out, put the fan sh the rack shelf in the rack, put the fan controller in front of the rack shelf and screw through both of them into the same cage nuts. So you've just got the fan controller and then a rack shelf sticking out behind it. That way I could put the power supply on the, on the shelf behind the fan controller, zip tie it down to keep it nice and secure, and then also for all the slack, slack cables that are all currently sort of zip tied together behind the fan controller, they could also be tied onto the rack shelf and it would just keep it all really neatly out of the way. So I think at some point I'll buy a cheap little one new fan sh um, rack shelf and do that. But yeah, it works really well. I think if I had one complaint though, and it, it would just be about the, the controls on the AC Infinity unit, and it's only one minor detail but it would make a huge difference it doesn't have the ability to set a minimum fan speed. So you can set a maximum fan speed, and that's the feed. So on smart fan mode, that's the maximum speed it'll go up to. However, there is no way to stop it turning the fan completely off if the rack is too cool. The difficulty with that is that with this rack here, there is no chance that without the fan running, it would maintain a cool temperature. It will always get too hot and need the fan. So the problem is that when the rack gets too cool, if the fact the, the cooling system the fans do good, too good a job and cool it down or the room's a little bit cold for, during the day, the rack will cool down enough that the fans will turn off. And at that point, there's no cooling in the rack, the rack will start heating up again and the fans they need to turn on again. And then you notice that cycling. In order to try and reduce the cycling, I then ended up setting the buffer to three, so it has to increase by three degrees for each step up in fan speed. And that's helped, but it then means that to actually reach fan speed six, if the rack's really, really heating up, the rack has to heat up a fair bit before it actually reaches a, the maximum fan speed. On the other hand, if I was able to say I have a minimum fan speed, I could set that to 1 so that the rack can be at any temperature below a certain threshold and the fans will always run at speed 1. 
but if the rack started to heat up a little bit too quickly and started getting a bit too hot, the fan speed could very quickly ramp up at one fan speed unit per degree increase and get up to fan speed 6 really, really quickly and cool it down. Now, this doesn't really look like the sort of device that's firmware upgradable, so it's not something AC Infinity could really release a firmware upgrade for, unfortunately. But if they are watching this video, which they probably won't be, but if they were, in a future version of this product, it would be really nice to have either a way to set a minimum fan speed or a way to at least tell it to not ever turn the fans off. So that's a little gripe there. Setting the buffer has kind of rectified it. I think the only thing I might need to do is at certain times of year, say in winter when it's a bit colder inside, I might need to adjust the set threshold because currently I set it so that all day basically it can go between say 30 and 32 degrees inside the rack and the fans will say will stay on speed one which is what I want and it, all day today it's basically done that but in winter for example if the room started getting a bit colder it's currently about 23 degrees inside and in winter it's usually about 19 degrees inside at that point the rack would be running a lot cooler and we'd start having the fan turning off. So it may be a case that throughout the year I might need to adjust the set temperature just to kind of keep it at that speed where on average it's generally sitting around fan speed 1 and it can increase if it needs to. So yeah, one little complaint there, but other than that it works really really well. And I am just amazed at how much this has cut the sound down. It's really impressive. So yeah, what we'll now do is we'll quickly jump over some performance tests. I won't go too much into detail on them because that would be very boring, but we'll go through some of the tests I found just to give a rough idea and then we'll wrap this up. So here we are with the test of the sound insulation. So for this test, I could have used my rack as is with just my normal 2U server and the switch, but it wasn't really loud enough to really get accurate readings. My sound level meter can only really go down to 35 decibels, so I was right at the bottom of the range of that. So what I did was I took a little 1U server that I have that you'll be seeing in a future video, and I put that in the rack as well. And in that server's BIOS, you can set the fans to different speeds and that server can get very loud at high fan speeds. Thankfully it doesn't need to run at that speed normally. So what I did is I put that, fan, that server in the rack both before and after, ran the fan at various speeds, 35%, 50% and 100%, and measures noise levels. And I measure the noise level from both the front of the rack and the side of the rack. So at the front I'm measuring the sound through the glass, and at the side I'm measuring it through the metal that will later be covered with insulation on the inside. And these are the results. Now, you can't really make out the exact decibel volume from this, it's not usually important. What we're really caring about is a reduction here. So if we bring in the results from after the sound treatment, you can see quite a big reduction. And here's the values. So you can see here, without the server fan running at all, we're getting a reduction of a couple of decibels. But I wonder how much this is just due to the, the sound meter not working at such a low level, or just background noise being more of an influence. But it's still a reduction. But then when we introduce the server fan, even at 35%, we're seeing reductions well, well in excess of 4 decibels. And then with the server fan set to 100%, we're seeing reductions of 7 to 9 decibels. It's pretty significant. And this really impressed me. While these numbers don't seem particularly big, it's important to bear in mind that decibels are a logarithmic scale. So it's not like a linear scale, where going down by 4 decibels when you're really measuring de levels in the 50s would be quite a small decrease. A 4 decibel decrease is quite significant. It's one of those things that's really hard to kind of pinpoint and explain if you don't have an innate understanding of sound. But what people roughly seem to say is at a 10 decibel decrease, that's a perceivable halving of the sound level. So even going down by 4 or 5 decibels, that's going to be a significant decrease, and I've definitely noticed it. What I'll also do now is I'll play some sound recordings of both before and after at the different fan speeds, just so you can kind of visualise what this sounds like. Because the sound measurements are one thing, but actually being able to hear the difference and hearing how the sound insulation affects different frequencies in the sound is probably going to be more useful. So let's play those.
So yep, there was the sound samples. And I don't know how well it came across in the recording, but hopefully it was quite clear how much of a difference the sound insulations made. Next up, we can see how the insulation and cooling system affected the temperature of the rack. So what you're seeing here is both before and after, with the fans on and off. And when I've got the new fans which are speed controlled, they're set to level 1, which is the lowest level. So you can see, at level 1 on the new fans, the rack was the exact same temperature as the old fans. But of course the old fan was running at its maximum speed, so the new fans matching that at their lowest speed is pretty good. Then if we look at both racks with the fans off, you can see quite a difference. Before with the fans off, the rack reached around about 39 degrees. However, now with the fans off, the rack reaches 43 degrees. And that was only over maybe an hour or so. It might have gone up even more if I left it longer. And that really shows how the sound, ins sound insulation is also thermally insulating the rack. You can also see it on the thermal image. If I pull up the thermal image I showed before, and then also pull up a new thermal image I took after putting the sound insulation in, you can clearly see that the sides of the rack with the sound insulation don't have nearly as much heat leaking out of them. So it's definitely very important to have the cooling system. Additionally, that was only with the new fans at level 1. If we bring the new fans up to level 6, you can see quite a significant decrease in temperature, bringing it all the way down to 31 degrees. So that shows that the new fans have a lot of headroom and can definitely cool the rack down quite a lot more. So if any of the equipment in the rack is working particularly hard or something, there's plenty of cooling capacity there to get it nice and cool. So there we go, that's the improvements I've made to my home server rack. And as I've said before, I am so impressed with how this well has worked. I was hoping it would make some sort of difference, but I didn't expect the difference to be this noticeable, and I wish I did it much sooner. The new cooling system is also really good, it's a massive upgrade over what I had before, and it's really nice to have a quite a nice integrated, sort of well-polished cooling system for a server rack. I just wish it was more widely available in different markets, so it's a pain having to import it from the US, but this is definitely a really good product and it works really well. The other thing I hadn't mentioned earlier is just how much I prefer how this looks. I like the grey rack versus the black version they did, because when it's in the corner of the room it blends in a bit more with the, you know, the white walls, it kind of blends in. Had the whole outer side, outer walls of the rack been black, it would have really stood out in the room. However, I wasn't really as much of a fan of the of the grey on the insides because it just kind of it made the inside look a bit brighter and it it just I just wasn't a big, as big a fan of it. But with that black foam on the inside, it now looks really cool. You've got that black inner walls which looks really good. It's really matte; it doesn't reflect much light. It just looks really really nice. So that even that just looks a lot better as well. So yeah, hopefully you found that useful or interesting or whatever. I'll put links to the cooling system and the foam in the description. And also stand by for future videos where we're going to do still a fair few more networking projects coming up very soon. So definitely stay tuned for those. But yeah, all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching.